Elimination reactions of alcohol is going to be the topic of this lesson. And we learned earlier in this chapter that the OH is not a good leaving group, but if you protonate it, turn it into water, it becomes a good leaving group. Now, earlier in the chapter, we saw in this context, we could do some substitution reactions, very specific ones. And now we're going to learn that we have elimination reactions on the table as well. And we'll start off presenting this in kind of the standard way that all of you are likely to see. And then we'll conclude this lesson with a couple of special cases that only some of you will encounter in your undergraduate studies. Now, this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so we see here, uh, the reagent of choice for alcohol elimination here is concentrated H2SO4. Now, a couple things to note. We saw that with HCl, HBr, or HI, we might be doing substitution. And the idea is that chloride, bromide, iodide are good nucleophiles. But when we use H2SO4, the conjugate base here is not chloride, bromide, or iodide. It's HSO4 minus, which is big and not a good nucleophile. And it kind of removes uh, a, a normal substitution reaction, at least involving the conjugate base of H2SO4 from being on the table. So we'll see later on, for some of you, you might be on the hook for a different substitution product. So, but for now, we're going to focus just on the elimination here. And so the region of choice is going to be concentrated H2SO4. So we'll come back and talk about why it's got to be concentrated because we learned earlier that with an alkene, we could use dilute H2SO4 to form an alcohol. Well, now we're starting with the alcohol and with concentrated H2SO4, we can form the alkene, the reverse reaction. And the difference really does come into how concentrated is your sulfuric acid. All right, so let's kind of see how this reaction works here. So once again, we are going to turn our uh, alcohol, in, which has a poor leaving group, an OH, to a good leaving group. And so we're going to protonate it with our sulfuric acid. All right, so there we've got our good leaving group. So, and once you've got a good leaving group, go ahead and have it leave. And I probably should keep in mind that I've also formed some HSO4 minus there. All right, that's gonna take us to forming a carbocation. Cool, and that takes us to our carbocation. Just like normal, if you've got a carbocation, you should check for rearrangements. Now, ours in this example happens to be tertiary, and the three adjacent carbons would not be more stable, so we're not going to get any sort of rearrangement here, but it is something that is possible here. Uh, and in this case, uh, with H2SO4, uh, you're always going to follow Zaidsev's rule to get the major product. Now, again, you're going to form some minor product, too, and form the anti zaidsev or Hoffman product, but the major is going to follow Zaidsev's rule every time. All right, so in this case, we've got our alpha carbon as the carbocation, and then we've got three adjacent beta carbons. And our secondaries, being more substituted, uh, is where Zaitsev is going to deprotonate, uh, whereas uh, Hoffman would go with our primary over here. So but let's draw one of these hydrogens out. So, And then you can have water or the HSO4 minus, but you'll commonly see it used with water, come and deprotonate. giving us our alkene. All right, so if we look at our mechanism here, so with our tertiary alcohol, this went by an E1 mechanism. We had the leaving group leave before deprotonating, so it happened in two separate steps. Slow step was the carbocation formation, so but totally, let's do this in blue. The E1 mechanism. Cool, and E1 works great for tertiary and secondary. It doesn't work well for primary, but we find if we do this with a primary alcohol, it still works. And we're gonna run to the same thing we saw with HCl, HBr, HI, is that for a tertiary or secondary alcohol, those reactions go by SN1. But with a primary or methanol, it goes by SN2. We're gonna see the same thing here with a tertiary or secondary alcohol, our elimination reaction is gonna go by E1. That's the preferred mechanism here. But for a primary, uh, it, it can't go by E1 because you can't form a primary carbocation. And so it still works though, and it turns out it's going by the E2 mechanism instead. And so we can't just say that it goes by the same mechanism every time. So you're gonna have to be concerned with what kind of alcohol do you have? Tertiary or secondary, E1, primary, E2. And so let's draw out another molecule of sulfuric acid and work out our mechanism here.
All right, so once again, first step, we're gonna protonate that alcohol, turn that OH, which is a poor leaving group, into a good leaving group. All right, so but in this case, it can't leave on its own. So again, uh, it can't form a primary carbon cation. So we're gonna have to deprotonate all in the same step. And so on our adjacent carbon, in this case, it's the only adjacent carbon we have with a primary. So we don't have to worry about Zaytsev or anti-Zaytsev. There's only one alkene product that's even possible. So, but here's our alpha carbon. And the only adjacent carbon we have is that guy. So we're just gonna deprotonate one of those hydrogens, which everyone happened to be antiperiplanar. I'm not gonna worry about the stereochemistry here though. Not the point of this lesson. So, and I, truth be told, I should probably draw out this because we don't have a water molecule in this case that's even possible because it's still attached there. So we'll deprotonate with our HSO4 minus. And just like an E2 reaction, you deprotonate, you form the pi bond, and the leaving group leaves all at the same time. It's a concerted mechanism. Cool, and there's our alkene. So, sweet. This is pretty standard stuff. This is what most of you are all, all on the hook for. But I do want to cover a couple of things that maybe you're not completely familiar with. Um, and maybe it's not even going to be covered in some of your classes. So uh, if you've got a pretty run-of-the-mill class, maybe you don't see the next thing. And uh, we'll go through a couple things after that, maybe even more likely not to have seen. So, But some of you are going to be on the hook for these in your undergraduate experience, and so I definitely want to present them. So let's take another look at something similar to this one up here, but just a little bit different. All right, so say we start with this alcohol instead. So out on the primary carbon here. So, and we're gonna use, again, concentrated H2SO4, and we're gonna predict the product here. I'm not gonna show the whole mechanism, but we are gonna predict the product, and we've gotta explain something, because on initial inspection, it looks like the only possible product. So there's your alpha carbon, there's your beta. And because it's on a primary carbon, we're not gonna go through a carbocation intermediate, at least we don't think we are. So, but not gonna go through, a, we're not gonna form a primary carbocation at the very least we can say. And so it's gonna go by the E2 mechanism. And if it goes by the E2 mechanism, well then if you only have one beta carbon, then you can only form the alkene in one location. And so it looks like our major product should be this. In fact, that looks like the only elimination product, except that it's not. So the actual major product ends up being this. And whether you draw the alkene here, here it's equivalent, same thing, either way. And so the question we got to answer is, well, why in the world is this the major product, not the, this one? Because this doesn't even seem like this one's possible, except that it is. And so want to go back in time for just a second to the alkene chapter you guys learned. So, and you guys learned that if you use dilute H2SO4, that you can turn an alkene into an alcohol. So just acid catalyzed hydration. And the intermediate for this was uh, a carbocation. So you're first gonna go and get an H plus from an H3O plus molecule, since H2SO4 would associate completely in water to form H3O plus. So, and once you get that H, it'll go on the less substituted side and you'll get the more substituted carbocation right here. That's what's going on. And then water would come and attack and a couple steps later, you'd end up with your product. The key I want to focus on is that lovely carbocation right there. So here's the deal. You are going to go through uh, initially E2 elimination and form this thing, but when it forms, it's in a solution of H2SO4. Now, it's not in a solution of dilute H2SO4, but it is in a solution of H2SO4 even though it's concentrated. And as a result, you're actually going to form an equilibrium with a tiny amount of that carbocation, just as if you were gonna go and form this lovely product again, right? So, so you're gonna form some of that carbocation, so, but again, with concentrated H2SO4, the equilibrium's gonna favor the, uh, uh, the alkene. With dilute H2SO4, this equilibrium favors the alcohol. So but we're in concentrated, so we're gonna form this carbocation, but it's gonna revert back most of it and, and favor formation of an alkene. But it's like, well, shoot, if I'm gonna revert back, I'd rather not form this alkene, I'd rather form the Zaitsev one, 
looking at that carbocation. And so as a result, this ends up being your major product. It's not the one we'd initially predict, so, but it would end up in this case being the major one. And so I cover this, a professor at my university, this was a big point of emphasis for him. And so maybe it has been at your, uh, in your particular class as well. So I cover that, but again, some of you probably never seen such an example. So just wanna cover it for those of you who might benefit. Wanna take a look at a couple of other things that are even less common as well. All right, so I want to revisit one of the reactions we've already studied. And so it turns out there's actually two what are called possible dehydration reactions. And one of them is the elimination we've already studied, but there's also what's called bimolecular dehydration, which is actually a substitution reaction going on, as we'll see. And so not all of you are going to see this, but it is taught in some of the standard textbooks and is presented in some of the standard classes, so this will be relevant to some of you. All right, so we've already seen this. So take a, a primary alcohol here and concentrate H4. We're gonna form an alkene. With it being a primary alcohol, this is gonna proceed through the E2 mechanism. So, but I do wanna examine another possible reaction that could happen here. So again, we're gonna protonate our alcohol. So, and now our OH, which is a bad leaving group, is turned into water, which is a good leaving group. And in this case, we did E2 elimination in the top reaction. Well, now instead we're going to do SN2. And the question is, who's the nucleophile? Well, it's not going to be HSO4 minus, our conjugate base here. He's still a bad nucleophile. So, and it's not the greatest nucleophile either. However, it is possible. And we'll have another one of our alcohol come in and do the backside attack. And that's why they call this bimolecular dehydration because it involves two molecules of the alcohol. It's still gonna involve the loss of water as a leaving group. So, but what we're gonna do is just gonna come in here and do backside attack. Kick off the leaving group. Cool, that takes us here, and then we'll take that water that we just formed as well and use it to deprotonate and form an ether as our final product here. And again, this occurs through SN2. Okay, so if both of these products are possible, then how in the world are we going to distinguish between them? Well, it turns out that elimination gets favored at higher temperatures because it's more entropically favored based on the number of reactants used to make the number of products. So we see there's an entropic disadvantage in this reaction because it's actually going to take more molecules to create than the products, you know, more reactants than products. So it's a decrease in number of molecules, if you will, which is entropically unfavorable. Well, E2 here is going to, you know, equal number of each. So the same number of reactants as products, it's kind of entropically neutral, but definitely more favorable than this process. Well, things that are more entropically favorable are favored at high temperatures. So as the temperature gets elevated, this E2 reaction gets favored over this one. And what we can't just write high temperatures because it turns out both these reactions only occur at fairly high temperatures. And so the big difference here is we'll carry this one out at 180 degrees Celsius, and this one will carry out at 140 degrees Celsius. And some of you will be on the hook for these exact temperatures. And you're supposed to know that, oh yeah, for the alcohol dehydration, if it's at 180, do elimination. If it's at 140, do the substitution to form an ether instead. So we often call this unimolecular dehydration because it involved just a single molecule of the alcohol. We often call this bimolecular dehydration because it took two molecules of the alcohol to make our product. Cool. Like I said, not all of you will be on the hook for this. So for many of you, the only you know, reaction you'll have been presented with with concentrated H2S4 and alcohol was the elimination. And if that's the case, great, ignore this section. So, but again, some of you will have seen this distinction made. All right, this is technically gonna be an elimination, but it's definitely gonna be a little bit funky. And what we're gonna cover here is called the Pinacol rearrangement. And again, some of you will be on the hook for this. It will be presented specifically in your class, but some of you even who are not might see this show up more in a mechanistic sense. And it kind of has a twist on it. They might give you the reactant and the product. And even though you've never seen this specific reaction, it is a technically one of these elimination of an alcohols with concentrated sulfuric acid reactions. And they're gonna see if you can actually figure it out because mechanistically it's very similar, or at least has some similarities along the way. So in this case, this pinnacle rearrangement is specific to a vicinal diol. So again, diol to hydroxyl groups, vicinal meaning on adjacent carbons. So, and it starts off exactly the same as what we've seen here. And with concentrated H2SO4, first thing you're gonna do is protonate one of these alcohols. So that's what we'll do here as well.
All right, that's going to get you your good leaving group. And in this case, it's on a tertiary carbon. We're going to have it leave and form a carbocation. Cool, we got this tertiary carbocation. One thing we always got to consider with carbocations is the possibility of rearrangements. And we see this guy's tertiary and we look, these two adjacent carbons are primary and this one's only, uh, is also tertiary, but it's also just tertiary. So we shouldn't expect a rearrangement, right? Except not so fast. So rearrangements are all about getting a more stable carbocation. And usually that's about getting a more substituted carbocation, but don't forget it can also be about resonance stabilization. And having the carbocation in this location right here next to an oxygen with lone pairs means we'd get resonance. And so it doesn't look like there should be a rearrangement upon initial inspection, but there definitely is. And we're gonna have a methyl shift in this case. Either one of these methyl groups is gonna transfer over to that carbon. And yeah, I think we'll be okay here. So let's see if I can get the bond angles better than that. So, and once again, upon initial inspection, it actually looks like we've gotten a worse carbocation. So we used to have a tertiary, now we only have a secondary since we sent one of the methyls over. But again, it's gonna be secondary and stabilized by resonance. And if we draw that other resonance structure here, Well, that takes us almost to our final product here. All we're simply gonna do is deprotonate this hydrogen and then we'll have a ketone. And the ketone is gonna be your product of this pinnacle rearrangement. So in this case, we had our water leave. In fact, I forgot to draw that water molecule in when it left, so I'll draw it in here though. And that gets us to our final product. Cool. There's your final product of the pinnacle rearrangement. And uh, that's kind of the deal. Again, it's always for a vicinal dial that this starts off with. And hopefully you can recognize, oh, it's concentrated H2SO4, but it's not a normal one. It's with a vicinal dial. We're going to have a funky rearrangement here and end up with a ketone in the end. Now, again, not all of you are going to see this. Not all of you are going to have this presented formally in your class. But even for some of you that didn't have it presented formally, sometimes they like to give you uh, the reactant, the product, and say, show the mechanism. And even though you've never seen it before, in principle, we've you've learned how to do dehydration so of uh, alcohols and you've learned about carbocation rearrangements in the past and why they occur and so in principle you've learned everything you'd need to know to figure out this mechanism and so sometimes it shows up that way even though it's not been formally presented. Now, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the more helpful things you can do to help me promote the channel. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for practice problems, practice quizzes, practice chapter tests, practice final exams, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.